I don't remember how it started, but uh, whenever somebody tells me I'm going to visit Taiwa, visit Plum Village, then I just take a piece of paper and I put my hand and I draw the outline and I send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I completely forgot where we met for the first time and how we met. In the mid-60s, yeah. I got a phone call from the Buddhist Peace Fellowship and they said mm. Thich Nhat Hanh is coming to New York. She, he's just changing planes in New Jersey and uh, would you want to entertain him there while he's in, in, on the airport. So I went to the airport in I New remember. Jersey <laughs> and, oh, yeah. and you wrote a poem on a napkin for me. But I remember uh, one time when we were together in uh, at Columbia University, that was mm. the time when you were there. Mm. And Dan Berrigan, the peace activist, mm. was celebrating the Eucharist in the little room that I had rented there. Mm. And then you came and you recited the Heart Sutra. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when we walked together with a small group of people we were protesting against nuclear proliferation mm -hmm. in New York in 82 and... I think we were a group of 60 people only and uh, we, we had a, a... A flag. And uh, they invited me to join the, the march and I said that, well, I would join if they allow me to walk peacefully. Mm -hmm. So we organized a group and we walked so peacefully and then many people behind us got angry. <laughs> there was about half a million people walking on that day. Mm -hmm. And they shouted uh, from behind, can you walk? <laughs> and some of them overtook us and looked look back at us and they saw the way we walk. And they transformed. They see we are doing peace. We are not demanding peace. Mm -hmm. If you are not able to be peaceful and happy in every step, the peace march is not a peace march. <laughs> and then the organizers said, we show you a shortcut, and all of a sudden we were again at the head of the line, mm -hmm. and all the people that had passed us by mm -hmm. were coming from behind <laughs> and were passing us by again and looking, how did they get here, all of us? <laughs> The peace movement should be a practice uh, community. Peace is a practice. When you organize a group of people and asking for peace, that's not enough. And sometimes you do it uh, violently and with a lot of anger. And the peace uh, movement during the Vietnam War was uh, not very peaceful. In the beginning, it went well, but after having tried for a few years and not seeing any effect, we began to be impatient. We get angry, angrier and angrier, and finally they wanted victory of one side over the other side. So that is not really a peace movement. I think a peace movement should be a community of practice where people live together um, in brotherhood, sisterhood. I first came here when I was 21 years old. I was really frustrated because I'd just come to the end of my university degree and I suddenly looked back and I was like, is that it? <laughs> <laughs> is that all I'm going to learn? I thought I was coming here to discover life, the universe and everything and, and I felt that my deepest heart questions, I didn't feel that I touched the depth of life that is there to be touched. and. Um, a friend of mine died suddenly, and I thought, wow, if I die suddenly, will I feel that I fully lived my life? And um, it was that summer, right after my final exams, that I came to Plum Village. To be in Plum Village is a chance to really live deeply and fully, and um, I want to say beautifully. I think, I think all of us, we know life is precious, and when we lose someone, we know life is precious. And it was mindfulness that helped me feel that I've lived a moment, lived an hour, lived a day. It touched my human nature because in mindfulness we really live something through our body, through our, all our senses. And I feel very aware when I'm mindful and embodied. I feel like I'm totally human, totally alive, totally on the planet. So for me, I, to come to Plum Village is to touch life and find like-minded people also. 
a lot of us, I mean, we're friends, <laughs> as well as being <laughs> brothers and sisters. And uh, it's great to take time out, time out from the city, time out from studies, from work, traveling, and just um, be and live deeply with good people. We say that gratefulness is really always gratefulness for opportunity. When you see the flowers, it's the opportunity to enjoy them and to smell them. So even suffering is the opportunity mm. to learn compassion. And what you're grateful for is, is never the thing itself, but it's always the opportunity that this present given moment offers you. And it's always a given moment. Then when we respond, then we find this compassion. Death is not an enemy, because uh, without death, life, and birth be impossible. The death of something can bring about the birth of something. And when you look into your body in the present moment, you see death is happening in the right in here and the now. Mm -hmm. Millions of cells are dying in this very moment in order for new cells to be born. Even death is uh, a necessity for life. And that is what we, we call uh, in Buddhism the nature of interbeing. Gratefulness can be felt uh, with every step. You are alive and your feet are still strong enough for you to make steps on this beautiful planet. So with mindfulness of breathing, mindfulness of walking, every step you make brings you home to the here and the now so that you can get in touch with all the wonders of life. And every step like that can be nourishing and healing. During walking meditation, you stop the thinking. I think, therefore, I'm not truly really there. You can feel uh, the contact between your foot and the ground. Mother Earth is there. Mother Earth is in you. And there is a communion between you and Mother Earth. Mother Earth is the mother of all the saints, all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. You carry Mother Earth in you. You cannot die. You can transform. It's like a, a cloud transforming herself into the rain. A cloud can never die. There is no birth, no death. We spoke about birth and death, that is on the superficial, superficial level. But go deep down, the nature of everything is no birth and no death. From something, you can never become nothing. From someone, you can never become no one. We are here to offer the practice to help people like ourselves who live in the world outside. You know, we face with so many difficulties, so many challenges out there. We live in a world and society where things are changing constantly. And sometimes that you just have to keep up with it. Then we tend to lose ourselves. More tension, more anxiety accumulated within our body. And our practice here, it teaches us to come back to ourselves, to learn, how to take care of our body, our feelings, our emotions, so we can live life to the fullest in the present moment. It's true that if we do not have powers, you cannot do anything. Money is a power. There are those who have uh, a lot of money, who are so rich, but who suffer very much of loneliness, mm, depression, and fame. There are many movie stars and others who are very famous, but when you look deeply into their life, you see that they suffer very deeply. These kind of powers can be real powers, and you can become victims of these powers. But there are other kind of powers that can make you strong. The first power is the power of uh, cutting off. You are attached to, you are bound to a number of things, and that make you lose all your freedom. You know that it is uh, destroying you. It makes you not free, but you have no courage in order to cut off. And that is uh, freedom. 
and that those of us who are bound to a number of things that make us powerless. You may think that you cannot survive without it, without him, without her, without that kind of uh, position. But maybe it is the very obstacle for your true happiness. So how to release, cut off? You need power. And that is the first power that is needed for you, that can set you free. The second power is to forgive and to love. Even that person is not lovable, but you can still love him or her because you are capable to see the suffering in him or in her. And your love grows. You become more powerful. And that is love without frontier, without discrimination. That's true love. That is the love of God, of the Buddha. And you have to train yourself in order to love like that. You don't leave anyone outside of your love. All embracing. And the third power is the power to understand. You are no longer afraid. When you understand, you are no longer angry and fearful. And that needs meditation, a contemplation, looking deeply, and then you get the insight the vision of uh, interbeing, the vision of interconnectedness. And that kind of knowledge uh, removes all kinds of discrimination, separation. And these are very powerful kind of uh, uh, energies. If uh, in our community the, there are those who have these kind of powers, it's certain that we can, we can make history, we can change history. That is why uh, we recommend gratefulness because it brings you into the now. Uh, you can be grateful for the past and for the future, but only now. So when you are grateful, you really appreciate the given moment and all this marvelous opportunity that's given you at this moment. Uh, incredible, incredible gift, so you are now. And then this whole thing starts. Globalization in all the different aspects, and cultural, economic, religious, and political, whatever. That this is an amazing time where so many of the world's wisdom traditions are becoming accessible in so many different languages. So for me, only in this generation can I have access to the wisdom of Buddhism. But at the same time, I can complement it, if I like, with studying the wisdom of Christian mystics as well. What I'm so grateful to our teacher, Thai, for offering is a very clear path um, for young people, there are practices that we can all do. We can master our breathing. We can learn the art of total relaxation. We can learn to handle our strong emotions. We can learn to take care of our life in such a way that we can generate happiness, that we can really create happiness for ourselves and our loved ones. And we have lots of practices, not just the breathing meditation, but walking meditation, sitting meditation, eating meditation ice cream meditation, coffee meditation, whatever you like. We, everything can be applied, but especially in moments of crisis, stress, stress and tension, we really have these tools with the body and, and relaxation that can really help us overcome difficulties, but above all, take care of ourselves. 2002, after serving in the US military, uh, I was over in Desert Storm, Desert Shield, and then I was having problems with mild case of PTSD and my parents thought it would be great for me to maybe try to come here and try to um, learn something. And so I've been a monastic for 10 years now. As far as PTSD is concerned, um, the practice is very helpful. And in our practice here, we have to be aware of what's coming up in our body, whether it's our emotions, what we're feeling, and being in the um, present moment. And that's all a big part of helping with PTSD. By the way of mindful breathing, mindful sitting, you bring your mind home to your body. And when mind and body are together, you are established in the here and the now. That's mindfulness. Mindfulness is to be fully present in the here and the now. And that is a practice. When you make a step mindfully, you arrive in the here and the now. That is where life is available. That is where the kingdom of God is available. 
you are yourself. And when you are yourself, fully present, fully alive in the here and the now, and then the tea becomes something very real. And you are drinking your tea and not your sorrow, your fear, your anger, or your conversation. So it is possible to live every moment of your daily life like that. And God is always with you. That practical, concrete notion of love, uh, I see that in uh, living yes to belonging. It's the yes to belonging. Mm. Uh, but not just saying yes, but living yes, we belong. Uh, I th think much of what you said brought that out also. We belong together. And to say yes to that, that is, that is love and that's available to us at all times. If you are capable of uh, being mindful and free, free from sorrow, anger, fear, free from the notions, and then touching the flower, you touch the kingdom of God and you touch God. Right in the here and the now, you don't have to die in order to go to the kingdom of God. It may be too late. We tend to get so caught up in success and achievement that we sacrifice so many things, especially um, relationships, relationships with ourselves as well as with others. And um, that's something I'm trying to undo um, here through the practice and through practice of mindfulness, um, cultivating awareness, not only about what's going on inside of me, but just being aware of everybody else who are around me. I was actually studying Zen at the Zen Study Society in New York. We went together to Riverside Church. I think it was Hans Küng who gave a, a talk there. Right after the talk, it was announced that Martin Luther King had been assassinated, unfortunately. I was very sick at the time. I could not eat anything. And I learned about uh, Martin Luther King's death. There is a little bit of despair. There is a little bit of anger. A few months before, I met uh, Martin Luther King in Geneva during a peace conference. He stayed up on the 11th floor with his uh, team of workers and uh, he invited me to come up uh, for breakfast, but I was caught in an interview, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I uh, came up late. And he kept um, breakfast warm for me. <laughs> it was the last time we met, and I was able to tell him that uh, in Vietnam, those uh, of us who struggle for peace and human rights, we consider him to be a living bodhisattva. Mm. I was very pleased to, to hear that. I'm glad that uh, I had the opportunity to tell him that before he died. What I have been doing since that time is just to build community. And we do it uh, for him <laughs> mm. also. That is why it's such a joy for me when I came last night to see that in some way you have uh, realized that dream in a way. I wonder if Martin Luther King's dream can ever be realized on a very wide scale. Maybe it's only small communities like Plum Village or a little monastery here and there. Martin Luther King spoke of uh, the beloved community because he was aware that without community you cannot do much. That is true in the case of the Buddha. A Buddha without a Sangha cannot do much. Martin Luther King knew that, so he spoke of the beloved community as a way to realize a dream, a sangha, a community, 
should have uh, harmony, brotherhood, sisterhood, the same ideal, and everyone should behave uh, like a cell in the same body, no discrimination. With a Sangha like that, you can achieve uh, whatever dream you have. I think Martin Luther King knew that. He was very concerned about building the community. As um, young people, I think that's very important to, to have that feeling of brotherhood and sisterhood because being brought up in the West, we're all raised to be a great individual. And now here, um, we're trying to to, to put that individual in with other individuals and building a, a good community and relying on each other. And that's what we call interbeing, you know. When I'm happy, my brother's happy. When I'm frustrated, he will be affected by my frustration too. And so to see the connection between human to human, how we affect each other. And uh, when we are aware of that, then we will be more mindful of our action because we see how it connects to, how we connect to each other. If uh, in our community that there are those who have these kind of powers, it's certain that we can, we can make history, we can change history. And not fame, political power, and, and wealth. <laughs>